Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Writer Mark Karlansky, by a series of coincidences, spent his life as a journalist and author in the shadow of Ernest Hemingway, starting with his presence in Idaho on the day Hemingway died. Mark would reside and work during his career in Paris, the Basque region of Spain, Cuba, and Ketchum, Idaho, all places where Hemingway lived and where his myth remains firmly implanted and celebrated. Mark struggled to free himself from the haunting presence of Hemingway, whose life, starting with the tales he told of being an ambulance driver in Italy in World War I, was a confusing blur of fact, exaggeration, hyperbole, and lies. And yet, Hemingway was undeniably one of the most gifted writers of the 20th century. More importantly, he believed that writers should go places and do things, living with the writer and journalist Martha Gellhorn in the Hotel Florida during the siege of Madrid during the Spanish Civil War hunting big game in Africa fishing for marlin off the coast of Key West and Cuba, or joining American combat units as they fought in France and Germany in World War II. Mark and I pursued this life as foreign correspondents for newspapers, something Hemingway also did throughout his career, although badly. Hemingway could never disentangle fact from fiction in his life and his writing, including his journalism. There is much in Hemingway's life and writing to admire and much to reject. Joining me to discuss his new book, The Importance of Not Being Earnest, My Life with the Uninvited Hemingway, is Mark Karlansky. Uh, so, Mark, in your book, you have some, I thought, very uh, wise comments about writing. I want to ask you about that. You say that writing is about establishing rhythm, and rhythm is often established by repetition. If a writer seems flat and without appeal, the problem is usually not that he or she does not use the right words, as is often believed, but that the writer is arrhythmic. And I thought that captured the essence of Hemingway's power as a writer. It's not the parody of the staccato sentences. It's that almost jazz-like rhythm. And I wondered if you could talk about that. Yeah, I mean, establishing a rhythm and setting up the, setting up the line. Um, I found it very rewarding that uh, uh, once in an interview later in his life, he listed Bach as one of his great influences. And I was thrilled to see that because uh, I'm, well, I'm a classical musician, not a very good one. Um, but I regard Bach as a tremendous influence on writing, a tremendous influence on everything. Um, and you know, Takata and Few, that's, that's, that's what we do. We, we have a theme, we set it up against another theme. We have uh, rhythms. Sometimes you change the key, but you, then you get back to the theme. Um, musicologists say that Bach uh, did theme and variation both horizontally and vertically. It's a very complex thing. But if you, if you really study what Bach was doing, you can learn a lot about writing. Well, you even say in the book, don't listen to music while you write. Oh, absolutely. It's a terrible mistake. You, because you, you have to establish the rhythm of what you're working on. If you're listening to music, you know, um, you know, you don't want your piece to come out sounding like Motown. <laughs> right. Although Motown's nice, but it's not what your piece is supposed to be. Uh, you write in the book that you are very influenced by the Beats, Allen Ginsberg. Uh, poetry, of course, so like great writing, is, I think, a form of music. Uh, and you say for this reason uh, you should uh, write, uh, th when you write, that poetry should not be completely understandable, that it expresses a truth that we can sense but is slightly beyond us. Uh, I thought that was a wonderful kind of uh, insight, and I wondered if you could just talk about that. Yeah, um, you know, William Carlos Williams, one of the great modernist poets, was giving a reading somewhere. And 
uh, somebody complained they didn't understand the poem. And he said, I'm not asking you to understand it. I'm just asking you to listen. Um, and uh, this is actually very much in line with uh, Hemingway's thinking about prose, which has famously become known as the iceberg theory. Um, where he didn't believe that everything should be explained. I, I think this is a very, very important idea, a very counterintuitive idea if you've spent time as a journalist. Newspapers kind of like you to explain things. But, uh, um, you know, life is, if you're, if you're recreating the experiences of life, everything in life isn't explained. You don't understand everything you say. You uh, say in the book, don't go to school to learn how to write. Uh, that if writing is any good, it, it's too personal an endeavor to be taught by someone else. Uh, I also thought, especially with the proliferation of uh, all these uh, uh, um, masters of fine arts, this was pretty wise advice. Yeah, I, uh, on the rare occasions when I find myself giving a writing course, I always begin by talking about a conversation I once had. I used to know Isaac Bashiva Singer, and he taught a course at the University of Miami. And I said to him once, what is it you teach there? And he said, I teach what can't be taught. Then <laughs> uh, said, you can't, really, you can't really teach writing. So when I give a writing course, I mean, the, the worst thing you could do to somebody who's struggling to become a writer um, is to tell them how to write. They have to find it in themselves. Uh, what, what I do in a writing class is I ask everybody to write something and read it and everybody else criticizes it. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to teach critical thinking and how you evaluate criticism that you receive. Uh, also, uh, but also just how you regard things critically. And I think that's all you can do. I mean, you, can't, uh, you can't tell somebody how but would it be fair to say that you can teach someone to write clearly, uh, but to write lyrically would be a difference? Yeah, you don't want to teach. I mean, lyricism is something, you know, if you're not Irish, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, you can't, what you shouldn't do and what is done a lot in writing classes is you cannot teach. You cannot teach people how to develop their prose style. Your prose style is your voice, and everybody has their own. Some voices are better than others. And yet, I, I think all writers, like many artists, begin by imitation. I, in in your case, uh, I think it was Hemingway. In mine, it was Faulkner. I was trying to write a lot of drivel that sounded like Go Down Moses, and it's a kind of trap. Uh, I mean, you need to break free from it. But uh, talk about those initial stages, because I think that is how you learn how to write and how you learn perhaps any kind of artistic expression is beginning through imitation. Yeah, I suppose so. And I suppose when I was really, yeah, I mean, you know, I was what, in something like third grade, when I decided I wanted to be a writer. And when I was young, uh, well, I mean, Hemingway was a huge it. Lawrence Ferlinghetti was a huge influence, but um, you eventually just have to find the voice that's within you. And you know, a good way to do this is um, don't try to write. You know, just tell somebody the story. Listen to how you're telling it, uh, because for some reason, we almost always use our own voice when we. When tell a story uh, when we speak. But we have this if we're, you know, novices and experienced people have this tendency to imitate great writers when they're, uh, when they're writing. If they just listen to how they speak. I mean, basically, most people do write the way they speak. Hemingway did. If you've ever heard recordings. You know, you read Hemingway and, you know, people are it's sort of odd the way people are talking, uh, but he talked like that. Well, Hemingway was a very stilted public speaker. He didn't like public speaking. No. Well, he wasn't very good at it.
No, he wasn't. And it, 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 it's funny because he he worked so hard at having a public persona, but uh, you know he just he hated getting up and speaking. Uh, he claimed ill health and not uh, going to uh, the, his Nobel Prize speech, but I, I think he just didn't want to do it. Let's talk about Hemingway, uh, who's this kind of shadow character in your book. Uh, he began very early on to turn himself into a myth, into a celebrity. Uh, he came back, uh, what was he, 19 or something after, uh, and as you point out in the book, by the way, he only spent a week. I believe, uh, uh, in in the front lines in Italy. Not not as a combat soldier. And not as a combat soldier, although he uh, rapidly inflated his role. Um, And you you, you write that he he essentially made himself a fictional character and it would dog dogged him throughout his life as he became more famous in the same way that I think it did a figure like Hunter Thompson. Uh, I want to speak about that idea of artist becoming myth because i think it's very dangerous well it is and it doesn't make you happy and uh hemingway towards the end of his life was complaining a lot how nobody knew who he really was and well you know whose fault was that him you know um but he did create this this mythical person that wasn't him uh but he was also a very complicated person uh which becomes clear when you talk to people who do it which are, are not many around there were still a few when I was working in the book. They're all talking about a different person. They, you know, the, the, the Hemingway who hunted in Idaho was not the Hemingway who hung out in the mountains. Um, and, you know, who was the real Hemingway? You know, he was, I think he was an intellectual. Uh, uh, Dorothy Dunry, who was uh, his uh, secretary and later his daughter-in-law said, when you really got to see the real Hemingway is if you get him to sit down and talk about writing or painting. That's who he was, an intellectual who thought about these things. You know, the, the, the Hemingway who talked about fishing and hunting and boxing, um, that, that wasn't who he was. Right. Well, it was this kind of hyper-masculine myth. And yet if you read, I think some of his best stuff was written in his early 20s, A Clean, Well-Lighted Place, uh, these are incredibly cat in the rain. These are very sensitive stories uh, that I think show exactly what, uh, illustrate the point you're making. He wrote a story that the title of it escaped me at the moment. He wrote a story, one of his earlier stories, about this guy who comes back from the war. It's one of the Nick Adams stories. He comes back from the war and he makes up all sorts of stories about his bravado and his war experience and they're all lies and he can't face himself or deal with his his guilt over the things that really happened because he lied so much isn't it interesting that Hemingway wrote that story right (laughs) so you and I both worked as newspaper reporters and you write in your book that newspaper writing can crush creative expression Uh, And that's why, as you say, the prose of many fine journalists, if stretched to book length, induces real pain. And then you quote the novelist William Kennedy, who also worked as a newspaper reporter, who says that while journalism gave him entry into a world he had no right to enter, which I think is one of the reasons to be a journalist, it also pounded into him the voice of literary objectivity, which he calls, quote, a journalistic virus that paralyzes the imagination and cripples the language. So uh, I think there are benefits to having worked as a newspaper reporter. Part of it is being able to go places and do things, as Hemingway correctly points out. Uh, it also it teaches you to write cleanly and quickly. Uh, but I think that that transition to being a book writer, it, it, it also that newspaper ethos, as you correctly point out, can cripple you. Just talk about that. Yeah, I mean, uh when I was writing for newspapers, I mean, I, I, I loved it, but I never intended to remain a newspaper writer. Uh, you know, it was so, it was more formulaic then than it is today, you know, it was like the lead and the nut graph. And then, you know, I always felt like if I wrote a good lead and a good nut graph, I, then, you know, the other 600 words would just be there. 
and you were done. Um, well, we, we used to call it bee matter. <laughs> it was just vomiting up what you'd written a few days before. Right. And um, I remember once uh, talking to uh, my editor, foreign editor at the Chicago Tribune, who was one of my favorite editors. He was a really great editor and an experienced foreign correspondent and a, and a good guy to work with. And he called me up one day and said, you have just written a 50 word lead. And the only thing I could think of to say to him was, have you never read Proust? Right. <laughs> well, but, Proust did not write for newspapers, I believe. No, I, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yeah, newspaper, writing for newspapers, exactly like Bill Kennedy said, it teaches you how to get in places, talk to people you'd never get to meet otherwise. And it's a, it's a great experience. But the writing part is not a great experience. Uh, um, Although a clever lead, I mean, we used to spend a lot of time on our leads because it's a hook. And it's something that Graham Greene would always do at the front end of his novels is use a very clever, well thought out lead to hook you into the novel. Hemingway, too. Look at Hemingway's short stories. Every one of Hemingway's short stories is a great opening line. Hmm. And he really understood that idea that you hook them in the first line. Um, in, the, in, in the fall, the war was still there, but we didn't go to it anymore. Yeah. Opening line of, in another country. Um, and, you know, it's often said there's a lot that's been written about what Hemingway learned from writing for newspapers. I don't think he learned much from writing for newspapers. If you read his newspaper copy, he didn't even learn how to write for newspapers. No, it's pretty bad. That's the interesting. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know how he got away with it. No editor I ever worked with would have taken copy like that. Um, but what he learned from, is that he was an avant-garde writer, part of the modernist movement. And it's modernism that that made him so clean and concise. It's not this cable ease, it's how they say that how he, you know, cabled stories to newspapers is how he got this style. It, it's, it's not true. He got this style from um, Ezra Pound and even Gertrude Stein did an interesting relationship with Gertrude Stein. He, uh, he thought that the, her writing was really interesting, but hopelessly unreadable. And he kind of admired the way, you know, she didn't care that she wasn't commercial. But of course, she came from a wealthy family, so she could do that. Um, but, uh, you know, Hemingway, Hemingway wanted to be that kind of experimental modernist, but do it in a way that he would be popular and have readers. And, that, and, and that's really what shaped his writing style, not, not newspaper work. Well, we forget that he was quite close to Joyce, uh, yeah. and they would all go out drinking, and Joyce loved drinking with Hemingway because he was a big guy. Uh, so when they both got obnoxious in some French bar, uh, people would leave them alone. Although, as you point out in your book, uh, his bravado as a boxer, again, was a myth. He used to fight Ezra Pound, of all people, because Pound knew nothing about boxing. Uh, and he liked to knock people down, but he couldn't actually fight anybody who was a boxer. You and I, by the way, both boxed. Yeah, I, I, um, I boxed enough to know he wasn't. I wasn't either. I was not a, I was not a great boxer. It was the opposite of Hemingway. I really didn't want to hurt him. That's the whole point of boxing, Mark. I know. <laughs> that, that was the difference between you and me. Um, <laughs> no, if I, if I planted a good punch, there'd be a part of me that might have pulled back. Ooh, I hope it didn't hurt him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you make the point in the book that I thought it was also really true and interesting that Hemingway really didn't know Spain or Cuba but that he created these powerful fictions of these places that still we're still grappling with. In many ways, we still can't uh, overcome. Yeah, uh, 
you know, he may have known Spain, but he didn't know the Basques. Right. That you were specific about that, yeah. He had no idea who the Basques were. And, and, you know, as someone who spent a lot of my life around Basques, you know, I read Hemingway. And it's, it's a little strange. That's not who Basques are. Never met a Basque and drink out of the wine skin. You know? <laughs> um, he, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he was a fiction writer and he, he, he created fiction. Uh, but, you know, as you say, um, in From the Bell Tolls, a uh, pretty good portrait of what Spain was like in the Civil War. And, you know, one of the interesting things for me, I mean, I didn't go to Spain because of Hemingway. Uh, I went to Spain because it was an incredible experience to see the last 1930s fascist dictatorship still in power. Um, and uh, uh, I, it was, it was a fascinating place. It was very different from any place else in the world because it was in this time war. Um, but it was, you know, the Paris that I went to was completely different than the Paris Hemingway went to and the Cuba I went to. You know, his Cuba was pre-revolutionary when it was post. And, you know, everything was different except Spain. Spain I went to because I went to Spain when Franco was still in power. And the Spain I went to was really the same Spain that he left. I want to talk about Spain. Uh, so he had a rupture with John Dos, Dos Passos in Spain, uh, Jose Robles uh, Pazos. He was uh, had, had taught it to John Hopkins. Uh, he translated Dos Passos. He was a colonel in the Republican Army during the war. He was arrested in December of 1936 by the principal communist hatchet man and homicidal maniac Andre Marti. He was the political commissar of the International Brigades, credited with the executions of 500 people uh, that he suspected of being spies. Hemingway knew about the executions, uh, and he knew about who Marty was in his novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls. He said that he, as quote, his face looked as though it was modeled from the waste material of his victims uh, that you find under the claws of a very old lion. Uh, and yet during the war, Hemingway would do not, not denounce the crimes in, in the way that Orwell did, uh, because of course it would have made him a pariah. And he was a feted and a celebrity uh, in Spain, would have shattered his privileged status. And he turned his back on Robles. He turned his back on Dos Passos. And I want to talk about that dishonesty, that cowardice, and that betrayal. Well, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, he, um, you know, so there's all these reporters there and he is getting better information, better sources than anyone because he's a celebrity. Most of his sources are from communists. And um, if, uh, if he reported on the bad stuff they were doing, he'd lose his sources. Now, you and I both know this is not a unique thing. This often without naming names, you know, in, in, in every war and every difficult situation, there are reporters who um, gloss over truths so that they won't offend the people who are feeding them information. It's, it's actually in a way, it's, it's the most journalistic thing he ever did, uh, unfortunately. Um, and then he wrote a novel and told all, revealed all the truth because he didn't need his sources. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's completely dishonest. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, cause he was around a lot of good reporters like Herbert Matthew and they sort of accepted that he would do this. Um, but you know, it's the way the civil war was covered I mean, the New York times and Herbert Matthew for the Republic and they had somebody else for the fascists and, um, you know, Matthew worked his side, and some guy worked his side, and they filed stories. And I think it must have been extremely confusing for New York Times readers to try to figure out what was going on in Spain, because you're getting two different versions all the time. They won the battle, they 
lost the battle. I mean, it was just completely opposite. Well, that's how the New York Times works. So, you know, as a foreign correspondent, you, I'm writing one thing in El Salvador, and the Washington Bureau is writing another uh, based on administration sources. And it's that old IF Stone line that people who have sources to the powerful, uh, he said they know more than I do. Unfortunately, most of it's false. And Hemingway uh, spewed propaganda. I mean, he talked about how they were winning the war on the eve of the Republican defeat. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's the whole thing about journalism. I mean, but one thing I always struggled with was the reporters who took everything the U.S. government told them. And sometimes the U.S. government had their own propaganda reasons. Sometimes they were just completely misinformed. Um, but these guys would just... Uh, Take what they were being fed. There's laziness, you know. You don't have to go out and find a well, story. Well, right. Well, that's the difference because most reporters in a war zone, the war zones I've been in, they don't want to go out. They're, we they want to get the handouts, and they're used against the rest of us that do go out. Uh, and Hemingway wrote a lot of his stories at the bar. He he didn't go out. No, he did go out. He he did both. He did both. I mean, all the material for. Uh, for whom the bell tolls was from a story he reported on. You know, those things actually happened about blowing up the bridge and stuff. And it was a story that the Communist Party put him up to. You know, they said, you know, go to this place and you'll get a good story. But did, did he go or did he interview the people who did it? No, he actually went. He went. He went out a lot. He'd go out with uh, Herbert Matthews and they, they, they'd go to places. I mean, he, uh, you'll appreciate this from having been in, in Nicaragua that, uh, you know, he had a great advantage that he had a car and plenty of gas. Right. Right. But when I was in in Nicaragua, I mean, it was pathetic. I just couldn't get anywhere unless I befriended somebody uh, who, uh, you know, had a car and a tank full of gas. Right. And uh, I was noticing in your new book, you talked about how you avoided working with people who were who were green and didn't know what they were doing. Um, in, in principle, I agree, but the truth is, you know, in Nicaragua, I would work with anybody who had the gasoline. Right. So I want to talk about World War II. He, uh, Hemingway blurred the line between correspondent and combatant. Uh, and uh, you and I both know that that's exceedingly dangerous for those of us who uh, attempt to report in a war zone, uh, he, because Hemingway, of course, carried a, a weapon. Uh, and perhaps used it, uh, and uh, it's already dangerous enough. Right. Don't shoot at me. I'm not a combatant. Oh, but this guy over here is <laughs> really bad. Um, but it's not clear how much of that he actually did. Well, that's the other thing we can't tell, which I think you acknowledge in your book, <laughs> since he's an unreliable source. Yeah, I don't think he had nearly the role in the liberation of Paris that he I know he didn't liberate the Ritz. Uh, there, there were no Germans in the Ritz by the time he got there. <laughs> Which, if you think about it, you know, the, the Allies have, have come down from Normandy, they've encircled Paris, the troops have come in, and the Germans are sitting around in the Ritz Hotel? Really? <laughs> um, so he would just make these things up. But, you know, one of the interesting things is that the, the other correspondents got fed up with him. You know, doing this stuff and having weapons and acting like a combatant, and they complained about it. And he, he was, uh, uh, they had a hearing, they examined him. They were considering throwing him out of the, uh, out of the front, uh, for violating the rules of the correspondent. Um, and he denied everything. He said, oh, I never did this stuff. <laughs> you, you never know when Hemingway is telling the truth. I want to talk about he had his, this is from Hemingway. I mean, he and he's dead on he, in the book. Uh, this is from your book. He said writers should work alone. They should see each other only after their work is done, and not too often then. Otherwise, they become like writers in New York, all angleworms in a bottle, trying to derive knowledge and nourishment from their own contact and from the bottle. I thought that was kind of brilliant. It, it is. And as a writer who lives in New York, I have to tell you that my saving grace is that I live in Manhattan, whereas all the other writers live in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, 
I want to talk a little bit about his uh, fiction. Um, and I, I think before we went on the air, you said uh, the only time he's honest is in his fiction. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, I mean, he had this code about his fiction about it being true and honest that he didn't have about his, his, his journalism. So, you know, you see in For Whom the Bell Tolls, he talks about the atrocities on both sides. Uh, he has this book that was published posthumously in which they're game hunting, big game hunting in Africa. And there's, there's this character named Hemingway who was talking about how really awful it is with white guys going to Africa and killing all their natural resources. And, uh, and really questioning the whole role of hunters. And, uh, you know, he, he, he would bring up lots of issues and lots of points of view. And he, he, he really, in his fiction, he wasn't really trying to um, indoctrinate you. He was trying to just show how it is. Would it be fair to say that that's because he wasn't writing about himself? That, that when he wrote about himself, in a way, he was, uh, you know, building this kind of mythic uh, uh, idea of who he was. But when he, when he stepped out of himself, he could be honest. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's not clear when he was writing about himself because, you know, in his fiction, he has all these characters, Nick Adams, for example, uh, all these characters that uh, clearly seem to be Hemingway or some aspect of him. Um, and then, you know, he writes about them in, in, in ways that are often uh, uh, critical, big and small ways. Uh, Jake Barnes, who, you know, you, you really feel is, is, is Hemingway, uh, cheats as a fly fisherman and loses bait, uh, something probably Hemingway wouldn't have done. Um, he was just very complicated. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, Dwayne Gladden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com.